is good news. continue to worship. Um, we worship a really good God, and sometimes it's, we don't always see that, uh, and there's a lot of situations in life and, and struggles we can go through where it, 
it doesn't seem like God is good, but he still is. Um, and this next song, it declares his goodness. Uh, we're just going to sing over and over again, God, you're so good. Uh, and so I encourage y'all, like, if there's an area of your life that you just are struggling to see God's goodness and declare that over that area, um, if it's anxiety, if it's depression, if it's any struggle at home, just, just bring it to mind and say, God, even in that, you're good. Uh, in every situation, you're good. And in, in every struggle, you're good. So let's declare that. We're gonna, we're, it says it a million times in the song, God, you're so good. And sometimes it takes singing it a lot to believe it. Um, and I encourage you all to just do your best. Think of that situation. Think of that struggle. And just declare that, God, you're good even in that.
always show your goodness, always. Whether we see it or not, you always show your goodness and you always show that you're faithful. Father, we're so thankful for times that we can we can come together and lift your name up and just declare that you're good. It's such a simple truth, but such a powerful truth that you're good. Father, I pray that you would guide Matt as he speaks tonight, that your Holy Spirit would speak through him, and our hearts would be open to hear from you and only you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. say anything after that it's just whew. I'm I'm trying to be sly but I le legit lost the table and oh uh, no it's it's like black on black over here sorry I'm a uh, there we go it is your fault no it's fine it's fine you guys doing all right yeah. doing well tonight Isn't the band ridiculous I just um, for a minute there I thought my mic was on because I heard something I was like oh um, but uh, anyways, man, we're, we're glad you guys have a good first day so far. Anyone, anyone freeze to death? Cool. <laughs> How is winter? <energy? laughs> Hypothermia. Uh, it's awesome. So, man, we're, we're, we are pumped. We are excited. This is just day one. So, uh, man, we are, we are pumped. We are excited. Um, Oh, uh, man, Johnny did an awesome job this morning painting this picture of how big God is. Um, if you begin to piece together some things, you realize that this weekend we are taking you on a bit of a journey. Uh, this, this whole weekend is, is centered around really who you are. That, that's, that's the premise. Is we, our hope and our prayer is that when you walk out of here, when you go back to your homes, your schools on Tuesday, um, that you would have full confidence and who God says you are. And, and we started this with, with declaring how big God is, right? Because, because I could say something about you, but if you don't know me, you're like, I'm not really, I don't know if I'm going to believe it or not. It looks kind of shady. He's weird. His beard's a different color than his hair. It's just weird, you know? Um, but, but when we begin to see what God says about us, right? When we put some framework really first on who he is, we see how big he is. Okay, well, yeah, God's legit. That's awesome. He's huge. But then we, we begin to unpack tonight his heart, his nature. Because here's the thing. I saw this interesting story. There was, a, there was a Japanese soldier in World War II. His name was Hiro Onoda. I totally butchered that, but I'm going to call him Hiro. World War II ended in 1945. This guy was in the Philippines. And uh, he, he heard rumors that the war ended, but he didn't believe him. He thought it was a lie. So he stayed hunkered down in the jungle, fighting and surviving. Pretty soon his two other comrades died, and he was the only one left. And they kept trying to convince this guy, like, hey, bro, the war's over. Like, come on home. And he didn't believe them. They, they dropped leaflets into the jungle, hoping he would read them. But he, he read them, and he thought that was just a tactic of the enemy. Like, ah, oh, they're just trying to trick me. They just want me to come out. Then they're going to get me. They're going to kill me. He, he, it finally took... This dude was in the jungle for 27 years after the war ended, still thinking it was going on. Until finally, they, they ran out of ideas. They went and got his, his old commander, who was retired at this point, flew him to the Philippines in the jungle to go find this guy and say, bro, the war's over. Go home. This dude lasted for 27 years in the jungle fighting a war that wasn't even going on because it was a lie. He, 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 he went thinking this one thing, but it was something completely different. And here's the reality, is that so many people walk around daily life believing one thing, believing lies about themselves, believing lies about who they are. And it's not true. 
It's not who God made you to be. It's not who God says you are. And so if we're going to unpack this, if we're going to get to the end of this and really have confidence in who God says we are, then we've got to begin to peel back the layers and identify these lies and identify what it really is. Because we see how big God is. Because there's this balance between you have to know the nature versus the character. Because if you know the nature of God, then you realize that he is infinitely powerful. He's, he's like this machine that could possibly do anything, but there's no purpose there's no design to it. Yet if you just know the character of God without the nature of God, you see this capacity to love and to have purpose and to have value, but this inability to do anything. So we have to match the two up. We see how big God is, and then we begin to see his character. So we've got to establish one thing to, before we go any further is this. So if you take notes, write this thing down, is that God's word is the ultimate source of truth. Not my opinion, my feelings, not my facts, not what somebody posted on Instagram. God's word is the ultimate, ultimate source of truth. Because before I can even, if you're a skeptic, before I can even tell you what God says, you're like, well, you're just going to use the Bible. And I don't believe it. Okay, great. Listen up then. You know that the, the Christianity isn't just about like believing in something. It's actually about believing in something that actually took place. You know, the Bible is the most historically accurate and proven work of literature. Seriously, there's over 25,000 digs, archaeological digs, support just the Old Testament alone. 25,000 of those. Uh, accuracy. You, you, you've ever had a, a group project at school, right? Yeah, you're like, you're the nervous laughter because you were the one that was in charge, right? What happens? One person does all the work and everyone just sits around, right? Because you're like, okay, you do the title page, I'll do the second page, you do the third page, and we're just going to hope and pray it comes together, right? And then it looks like just the biggest jumble and you get an F on it, right? You can't even get on the same page with your friends when you get in trouble. Oh, you're better than me. You never did that. Okay, sorry. Um, think about this. The Bible, 40 different authors, 10 countries, 20 occupations, over a span of 1,500 years, three languages, 3,000 characters, 551 places, 66 books, all with one message. You can't, you can't make that up. It is the most uh, accurately translated book in the world. Over billions and billions of copies that are sold under 1,200 languages. You guys have read and uh, read, read I was really good in school. Uh, You've heard of Plato, not the stuff that your parents tell you not to eat, right? Plato, like, you know, the, the author. Has anyone ever, like, told you, hey, we're going to read Plato? You're like, I don't believe it. It's not true, right? Well, when you look at it, when you, when you look at history, when you look at when a book was written, and then you look at the earliest manuscript, the earliest, like, document copy that you have of that, and you look at the span and the number of those copies, the, the New Testament alone blows everything else out of the water. For instance, Plato. It was written between, between 427 and 346 B.C. The, the first manuscript we have dated was 980. What does that mean? There was 1,200 years between when he wrote it and the date of the first copy. You're like, well, we probably got tons of those things, right? It's because we, we believe it. We're taught it. There's 10 of them. There's only 10 of those original copies. But yet, in school, you're taught this is a work of art. It's true. Don't doubt it. What about Aristotle? 11, 1,400 years between when he wrote it and between the date of the first copy that we have. And we've got 49 copies. All right, ready? Ready for this? The New Testament, written between 40 and 100 AD, between when it took place and the first documented copy we have, 25 years. Guess how many copies we have? 5,600. And some of, the, some of the later ones where there's between two and 300 years span between that, we have over 24,000 copies. So, so a skeptic would be like, no, I don't believe it. Well, history and science says, no, it's, it's legit. It's real. In fact, there's, there's prophecies all throughout Scripture. That prophecy is, is when somebody says something about something that's going to happen in the future. Right? There's all kinds of prophecies like throughout and and. When it comes to just the life of Jesus, there's around 300 or so, give or take, prophecies. And, and there's skeptics that have, like, tried to statistically prove that the Bible isn't real or isn't accurate. 
So these mathematicians, they got together and they decided to do the statistics of let's just say that chance happened, right? Let's just say that Jesus was a good person and, and he happened to be in the right place at the right time and he fulfilled some of these prophecies. So they started to do the math around these 300 prophecies and they, they came to this conclusion that if Jesus just fulfilled eight of the 300, if this dude just fulfilled by chance three of the 300, it would be this. It would be one in 10 to the 17th power. That'd be like taking the state of Texas, which is 268,000 square miles, right? I'm going to take a silver dollar. I'm going to write my name on it. Then we're going to hop on a plane. We're going to go to the state of Texas, and we're going to fill the state of Texas two feet deep all over with silver dollars. And then I'm going to chuck one out there and let it land, mix them all up, and say walk around for 10 days and pick one up. That's the odds that just eight of the 10 or eight of the 300 were fulfilled. They, they, they calculated out if just 400 or 48 of the 300 were fulfilled, the probability is 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Like that's 157 zeros behind it. To give you some framework, uh, 10 with only 52 zeros, that's the number of electrons in the entire universe. The entire universe. Okay, so let me... If we just take 10 to the 15th power, all right? Because you're like, these numbers, they don't, they don't mean a whole lot. It's hard to wrap our mind around it. They say actually anything beyond 100 zeros you, is just dumb. You, you can't even understand it. It, it. it goes past logic. It goes past understanding. We can't comprehend it. So let's go back to 10 to the 15th power. If you take two and a half of those, so two quadrillion, right? Uh, that's, and, and that's the number of... Um, of electrons in an inch, right? If we were to put the number of electrons together in an inch and we were to start counting them, right? So two and a half quadrillion, that's how many electrons are in an inch. And we were to start counting them. Let's say you're a really fast counter, okay? And you can count 250 per second, right? Guess how long we would be counting? 19 million years. Do you understand that? To count an inch and of, of, of a measurement of a probability that it was a fluke that Jesus just fulfilled eight of these prophecies, we would be here for 19 million years counting electrons, and it wouldn't even begin to scratch the surface of the probability of a being chance. So if you're an intelligent thinker, I would say that we would, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we could come to the conclusion right now that if God said it, it's probably true, right? If not, go buy a lottery ticket because you're, you're, you've got more faith than I, right? It's blind faith. So if, if God says something and we see that his word is proven statistically, historically, archaeologically, some kind of other ology I can't pronounce, I don't know, then maybe we should believe it. And here's something that we see when it comes to God's character. We see all throughout scripture, we see this theme. Write this thing down tonight. This is the, 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 the thing that I want you to walk out of here with tonight. Is that God is a perfect, loving father. We see a lot of aspects about God. We see he's holy, he's powerful, he's mighty, he's worthy. We see all of these things. But this overarching character and nature of God we see is that he is a perfect, loving father. I'm a visual person. I, I'm not just book smart. Um, this is a donut. Yeah, no one odd. Uh, this, this is the uh, gas station donut, right? Let's say that your whole life, this is the only donut you've ever eaten, okay? So your whole life, when somebody says donut, what pops in your head, light bulb, is this, right? It's got this weird sugar, flour, cornstarch, baby powder on the outside, right? You can toss it. You can leave these actually things out for a couple of weeks, and they're still the same as they were in the package. Uh, so if, if, you're, if, if this is the only donut you've ever experienced, when somebody says donut, like, bro, we're going to get some donuts. You're not like, ooh, right? You're not getting giddy. You're not like scraping together some money to go buy some donuts because 
Your perception of donut is based upon and is shaped by your understanding and your experience in life that this equates donut. So if somebody's all excited about donut, it doesn't compute to you because this is donut, right? But if you've now lived a sheltered life and you've come to know the hot and now Krispy Kreme <laughs> in all of its glory, right? Like, this is a real donut, okay, guys? A hot and now Krispy Kreme, it melts before you put it in your mouth. Like, that is awesome, right? These two are not the same. So here's the problem. When you're trying to talk these donuts to people who have only this kind of donut perspective, things don't line up. So when we talk about a perfect, loving father, we have, to, we have to understand that the same thing is happening, that we have to push aside the powdery donut perspective of what a father is, and we have to look at a perfect father and all of his goodness and all of his grace and all of his mercy and all of his perfection and all of his love. So when we talk about a perfect, loving father, it's, it's that kind of perfect, loving father we're talking about. And that maybe it's, it's, it's not the father that's wrong, but it's our perspective of who God is that needs to change, that needs to, that needs to, to, to be moved, to, to be transformed. Because just because what you've experienced on earth with, a, with an earthly father does not dictate God's goodness. In fact, David wrote this in Psalm 68. He says this. He says that God is a father to the fatherless. Defender of the widows, this is God, whose dwelling is holy. God places the lonely in families, and he sets the prisoners free and gives them joy. Jumping down to verse 9, he says, You send abundant rain, O God, to refresh the weary land. There your people finally settled, and with a bountiful harvest, God, you have provided for your needy people. David declares that God is a father to the fatherless. You know what? David didn't have a great interaction with his dad. If you remember the story with David and Goliath, David, uh, the, the, the prophet came to town to anoint the next king, and David's dad didn't even bother to get him out of a field. He said, hey, go grab all your sons. I'm going to pick out the next king. David's dad didn't even bother to get him out of the field. Didn't even think he was worthy to be in the lineup. David's perspective of God the Father was not based upon his God, the earthly father. Do you understand what I'm saying? So maybe, maybe, just maybe, we could walk out of here with a clearer glimpse, a clearer perspective of who God is. 1 John 3, 1 says, See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that's what we are. So why, why would this God who needs nothing from us, who is infinite, who is all-powerful, who literally has angels surrounding him 24-7, declaring holy, 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 worshiping him, yet he would, he would allow us to be his sons and daughters. So let's, let's jump in tonight. I want to take you to Luke chapter 15, very well-known story. Jesus teaches this parable about a father with two sons. Maybe we can gain some perspective on what a father is and what our heavenly father is like. Before we do that, let's pray. Jesus, you are good. And God, right now, I, I pray that you would open up our hearts and our minds. God, we would push back any perspective or any preconceived notion we have about who you are and your goodness. And we would take a look at this story that your son taught your people. And we look at the heart of the father who loves his children, who provides. So God, I, I pray that, that anything that we have believed about you that isn't true, that God, that you would bring that to surface as we pour through this. That God, that you would expose the lies of the enemy. And God, we would see you for who you really are. Jesus, we love you and it's in your mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 15, we're going to be starting in verse 11. You guys there? Mm, verse 11. All right. 
jumping in. It says, to illustrate this point further, Jesus had just told two different parables, kind of the same message, the same thing about something that was lost and now was found. Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now before you die. So his father agreed and divided his wealth between his sons. Basically, the son was saying, hey, dad, you're better off dead to me. Because usually you would split up the inheritance after someone died. But his, his son was so brazen, had such a disrespect for his dad. He's like, you know what? I could do better if, if I just had my, my share of what's going to be mine when you die now. Incredible insult. Imagine walking up to your dad and saying that now. Hmm? Yeah, just, here's your inheritance, you know? Like, it's incredibly disrespectful. But, you know, there's, there's he didn't just, like, fly off the cuff. There was, there was something that built up to this. Like, there was a thought process. There was a decision. He didn't just go rogue one day and, like, bust out in a random thought. Hey, you know what? I want my inheritance now. There was a way of thinking that this younger son had. There was, there was something he thought, there was a, there was a way that he, he, he believed, and he thought that he could get better on his own. It was a shift in his attitude and his thinking that led him down a series of paths that was based on a decision that ended in destruction. You know, sin is basically the same thing. is when we say, hey, you know what, I think I can do better on my own than by your way. And that's what the son was saying. Hey, I appreciate you've done for me, but you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take it from here. I'm going to get in the, in the driver's seat of my life, and I'm going to make my decisions because I think I could do better with my life than putting it in your hands, which always leads to destruction. But here's what happens. Here's the next thing is this. Write this down. is that God allows us to walk away. So his dad did it. He agreed, and he divided the wealth between his sons. Maybe that wouldn't be your reaction. But the father's reaction was to say, okay. I'll let you make your decision. The other night, I've got three kids. Uh, I've got two boys, and uh, we fight a lot. Like, we wrestle. Uh, we, we get pretty gangster like, about it. Like, we, we punch in the face. It's cool. They do it to me. I do it back. We love each other. Um, maybe it's not the best parenting advice, but they know if they punch me, they'll get punched back. So it's kind of that consequence thing. Um, I don't like to do it full speed, you know. But the other night, we were wrestling, and... Um, I had my, my oldest one pinned down, and he, he couldn't move. My, my younger son was trying to tickle the other one's feet, all right? Because as, as a younger brother, you're like, you're like I don't, there's no consequences right now. I'll just do what I want. And I looked at my, my younger son, Jude, and I said, Jude, if I were you, I wouldn't do that. He just kept looking at me. He's trying to grab the feet. He's holding the foot and being, you know, slapped around back and forth. I was like, Jude, I wouldn't do that. He's like, why? He's like, I said, you're going to get kicked in the face. No, no, no. I was like, Jude, you're going to get kicked in the face. Do you think Jude stopped? No. Knowing Jude, if you know my son Jude, he, he kept doing it. He kept doing it. And I'm, I'm, I'm punching my son. We're wrestling. And I'm like, Jude, stop, buddy. Stop. You're going to get kicked in the face. Jude, stop. You're going to get kicked in the face. Jude, stop. <laughs> ah! What happened? Jude, Jude got kicked in the face. And I'm looking at him. I was like, buddy. And I waited for the, like, the tears to stop and the screaming to stop. It looks like, what did daddy say? <laughs> You know, I'm like, I told you, I legit told you, I could have pushed you off of his feet. I could have put you in timeout. I could have said, dude, stop it. Stop it right now. But I said, I'm like, dude, you're going to get kicked in the face. Please don't do this. You're going to get kicked in the face. You're going to get kicked in the face. You got kicked in the face. <laughs> and there's, there's something about being a dad that sometimes you just, you have to let them. And God is a loving father who does not force himself upon us, but he has allowed us to make our own decisions and to make our own choices. Because if he forced us, it wouldn't be love. You have to love me. You, no, you really do. I do. Yes. Oh, you do? Oh, that's cool. I love you too, bro. <laughs> it's not love if it's forced. But God allows us to make decisions. And so this, in this parable, the father said, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... I don't like it, I don't appreciate it, but I'm, I'm going to let you make your own decisions. Verse 3, 13, sorry. 
A few days later, the younger son packed up his belongings and moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all of his money in wild living. About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. And he persuaded a local farmer to hire him. And the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the pods he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything to eat. Especially for a Jewish dude, pigs were unclean. You, you didn't associate. So this was basically rock bottom, maybe even below rock bottom for him. What he was doing was a disgrace. He had squandered everything. He had gone so far astray. Astray isn't even the right word. He had hit rock bottom. Verse 17. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food, enough to spare. And here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. Please take me as your hired servant. What's interesting is this prodigal son didn't try to find a way to make his situation better. He didn't say, you know, I'm going to just put my little teepee or something over in the corner of the pig pen, or I'll just cuddle up with Bertha over here. She'll keep me warm at night, you know. He, 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 didn't, he didn't actually even blame his dad or his friends or his diaper being put on too tight when he was little. He, he didn't cast blame on anyone else. He said, you know what, I, I've screwed up. I'm not, I'm not even worthy to be, to be called a son. I'm unworthy. But what's interesting is as disrespectful and as disgraceful as he was towards his dad, there was still something that was drawing him home. There was an essential character of his father that despite what he did was greater than that. Think about it. If, if, you, if you say something to your best friend or you just completely abandon them, the next day you see them, you're going to hide your head. You're, you're going to avoid them. But there was something about this dad, the, the love that was shown in the verses that we don't see, in the character and the nature of who he knew his dad was. And he said, you know, I've, I've, I've gone beyond rock bottom, but you know what? My dad's a gracious. He's a godly man. Maybe he'll just at least hire me on as a servant. Maybe I can just, I won't, I won't even look at him as a father anymore. I won't be, try to call myself a son. I'll just go back. He'll give me a job. And maybe I can eat. Verse 20. So he returned home to his father. Did I skip some verses? No, I didn't. So he returned home to his father. And when he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. You know, his dad, he saw him in the distance because he was looking. His dad was intentionally looking for his son. And I don't know where you are in your life. And I don't know where you are in your relationship with God. But if, if there's anything that is holding you back from, you know what, I'm, I'm finally going to turn over a new leaf and, and, and I'm going to pursue Jesus. Or maybe, you know what, I've, I've, I've gone astray. I've done my own thing for a season. But now is the time when, you know what, I want to pursue God where I'm going to go back to the Father. If there is anything in your mind, in your heart, in this world that is preventing you from doing what verse 20 says, so he returned home to the Father because you're afraid that, that dad has changed the locks or that he's angry or that he's forgotten that you, about you or that he's not looking. That's a lie. Because the Father, perfect in love, rejoices when his son comes home. Look at, look at our verse. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. And he embraced him and he kissed him. And his son said to him, he said, he said, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. It's funny, the father didn't even address in this next verse. He didn't even like say, yeah, you did wrong. You, you, you shouldn't have done that. What, what are you doing coming back here? The father didn't even address what the son was saying. 
But the father said to his servants, he said, quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring and get a sandals for his feet. And that fattened calf we've been having out back, kill the fattened calf we've been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine that was dead has now returned to life. And he was lost, but now he's found. And the party began. He threw a party the fact that his son had come home and come to his senses. Not the fact that his son came back groveling or apologetic. The fact that his son just came. He said, you know, this is, you are dead, you are gone, but I am so happy and I'm so elated and full of joy that you have come back that this is worth celebrating. Which we have to draw this conclusion from is that you don't have to work hard in order to earn the Father's love. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. There, there's nothing that you could do to earn the acceptance or the love of the Father. But he lavished it on his son. You know, they, they use the word prodigal, which means, which means wasteful, reckless. It means just a lavish spending of something, right? Because we look at the sun, we're like, yeah, you wasted the money. You, you just blew through it. You have nothing to show for yourself. But another aspect in this parable is, in fact, that the, the, the prodigal one, the, the lavish one, was, in fact, the father. Because he was lavish with his love towards his son. He said, you know, get the ring, get the robe, get the fattened calf. Get, servants, drop what you're doing and go, go prepare a party because we're going to celebrate just the fact that he decided to come home. And so if, if you have been doing your own thing and you think that you are too far in a distant land feeding the pigs based on your decisions or actions, that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because the nature of our God, the nature of the loving, perfect father that we have is one who rejoices when his sons and daughters come home. It's one who throws a feast, who says, hey, prepare the, the, the fattened calf. We're going to have a feast, and we're going to celebrate tonight. Because you were dead in sin, but now you are alive in Christ. And you have a hope, and you have a future. And it's in his family. So we can't earn it. You can't work hard to try to get it. See, here's the, the problem. Johnny kind of laid this out this morning, is that the most important thing about us is how we view God. The most important thing uh, about you is your image or your viewpoint of who God is. It, it shapes how you see yourself. It shapes how you see others. It, it shapes everything in your life. And if, if you can look back in your life and you can't adequately and confidently say, God has been so good to me. Your perspective of God is wrong. It needs healing. Because despite what you've experienced, despite the pain that may have been brought into your life, God is still good. He always has been. Psalm 22, verse 26 says, The poor will eat and be satisfied. All who seek the Lord will praise him. And their hearts will rejoice with everlasting joy. You know, the way that we begin to shake off the lies that the enemy has spoken over us, the things that we've spoken over ourselves or believed who we are, is one is to begin to see that, hey, this God who is speaking about me is infinite in power, who has created a vastness of the universe that we can't even wrap our minds around. And if this all-powerful all-knowing God, yet has the heart of a perfect, loving, gracious Father. Then maybe every word he says about me I should hang on to as if it was more precious than gold. Because here is the, the, the truth I want to leave us with tonight. 
as we begin to unwrap these things. And I've, I've, I've said this a lot to our students, but it's true that the voice that you believe determines the future that you experience. The voice that you choose to believe will determine the future that you experience. In, in a practical way, if, if your friend says, hey, bro, drink this bottle of hot sauce, it's going to be awesome. And you do it. Guess what kind of future you're going to experience pretty soon, right? So th the voices that we believe, the voices we believe about our potential, about our past, about who we are, all of those things, those voices, they determine and they shape the decisions that we make, the actions, the attitudes that we have, which shapes the future that we become to experience. It's proven over and over again. In fact, when I was, in, when I was little, um, I, was, I played baseball and soccer and football, and I, was, I played baseball. Like, I was on the team. That's about it. I was, I was bad. I was really bad, okay? I, I, and it's funny, it's like, I always grew up, I'm like, yeah, I'm good at baseball, but I'm looking back and I'm starting to look at things differently. I'm like, man, I was really bad. <laughs> like, I, I had this streak for this long time, longest time where I could not hit the ball. I struck out every time I got to the plate. Like, it was embarrassing. Like, I'd get up to the plate and my team would be like, all right, let's get our gloves. <laughs> it's two outs, we might as well just start walking. Like, it was bad. And I remember my dad was coaching one year. And, and he was at third base, and right before, um, anytime your, your parents, like, do something unexpected, like, hey, hold on a second, you're like, oh, what are they going to do? It just puts you at this uneasy, like, dad, don't embarrass me. But he, he, like, called a timeout real quick, which I was like, there's timeouts in baseball? I don't get this. And, and he, he called me over, and, and he starts talking to me. He starts giving me this pep talk, like, son, like, I, I know you've struck out, like, every time you've come up to bat. Every time, I'm like, yeah, Dad, I know, I know. But he's like, you know what? This time's going to be different. Because I think you're going to hit the ball, and you're going to believe it, and you're going to swing as hard as you can, and you're going to focus, and you're going to be determined, and you're going to do it, and you're going to hit it, and you're going to knock it out of the park. And you're, you're going to hit it, and you're going to run as hard as you can to first base. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, you know what? You're right. I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to my baseball card made pretty soon. I'm going to do this. And so I, it calls time in, and I'm all like, I'm jacked. I'm ready to just, like, hit somebody with a baseball bat. I walk up there, I'm like, and the pitcher's looking at me like, what is he? did he give him drugs or something? Like, just slipped something in his drink all of a sudden? And I remember getting up there, and I was like, you know, I'm going to hit this thing. I'm going to hit this thing. I'm going to hit this thing. I swung. I was like, nope, didn't hit that one. Right? And I got there, and I got there, and I was like, and I hit it. I hit the stinking ball. And I was like, what just happened? And then he was like, run. That's what comes next. I haven't gotten to that part yet before. I just always stopped here at the plate where you strike and you go back to the dugout. He's like, run. I'm like, so I'd love to tell you that I got a home run. I got out. <laughs> Great story, man. But I hit the ball. And you know what happened the next time I got up to play in the next game? You know what my dad did? He called the timeout again. And he pulled me over and he started giving me a pep talk. He's like, no, you're going to do it this time. You're going to hit it. It's gonna, I'm like, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Go bring it. You know, just. But my dad had confidence in me. My dad was like, son, you can do this. I know you've struck out every other time. But you know, this time is going to be different. My dad saw something in me that I didn't see. Let's be honest, maybe he really didn't even see it. He just spoke it. But there's something about the voice of our father. One of the fathers says, hey, you know what? You, you failed, and you failed, and you failed. But you know what? My grace is sufficient. I, I know you feel isolated, like you don't have friends, like you're, you're abandoned, like you're weird. But you know what? You are wonderfully and fearfully made. That's what your father says about you. 
You're too far gone. You, you, you've tried to pursue Jesus, but you know what? You're going to get back to school, and you're going to get back with your old friends and your old habits and the things that you said you're never going to do again, you're going to do again. You're just stuck, but you know what? Your father says that you are redeemed, that you in Christ you are made new. It's why you are still a far way off. God was looking for you. My wife was out of town all last week. I had my three kids by myself. Appreciated the prayers. Um, one night, not one of my proudest father moments, but one night my uh, the kids were just, I swear they had drank Red Bull or something. They were just crazy. And uh, it was bedtime which bedtime just means, hey, let's do everything we can but that. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I say one thing, and they're going to, everything but. And so I'm trying to put my daughter to bed, read her story. And she's like, she, she's a drama queen. She throws herself down on the ground, just lays there, and starts rolling, crying, and screaming. Like, <sighs> she's like her mother. <laughs> she, she's like me. She's like me. You made that worse than it was. She's like me. Then my, my kid, my, my boys were fighting in their room. And I'm like, guys, get in your bed, get in your bed. Get in. And I'm like, all three of you guys are crying right now. My, my brain is coming out of my ears. I went in there and I was like, I yelled at him. I was like, you gotta stop it right now. Get in your bed. Not even words were coming out. I put my daughter to bed, I read a book. And I go back in there and they're just like, like they didn't want to say a word. And I was like, crap. I gave him a hug and a kiss, and I prayed with my boys. And my oldest one just had this look of just like defeat on his face. It was a way to go, man. I remember I nailed next to my, kneeled down next to his bed, and I looked at my son in the eyes. And I said, like, Carson. You realize that there is never anything you could do in this world that would make me not love you. So you could spit in my face right now. You could punch me in the face. Don't do it. But I said, I said, you could punch me in the face right now. You could spit at me. You could do anything possible to me right now. But do you know what? It wouldn't change how much I love you. Because my love for you doesn't depend on what you do, Carson. We all make mistakes. We all disappoint God. We all do these things. But, but my love for you is not conditional. It goes beyond what you do. And you know what? The love of your heavenly Father is not conditional upon your actions. If it was, then you could earn your way into heaven, but you can't. His love is sufficient. His love and his grace and his mercy, co mercy covers a multitude of sins. If we would just be at the place where we would humble ourselves and we would come back to the Father and we would realize that he's not holding us at a distance, but he is, he is celebrating because we have come home to him. So here's our challenge for tonight. On the way out tonight, you're going to get a piece of paper. And when we say that we want to unpack these lies, we really want you to do it. So we want you to take tonight, all day tomorrow, to begin really thinking and praying, God, what are the, what are the things that I believe about who I am? What are, what are the lies that I have believed and why I believe them? Because you, you can't just think that you're going to think differently, but you have to actually come to terms with these lies. But because before you can establish truth, you've got to strip back the lies. Because the enemy who has come to steal, kill, and destroy your hope and your future and your joy in your life, that enemy, his native language is to lie. And he will say whatever he wants to try to discourage you and to try to make you think that you are disgraceful and that you are too far gone. But this weekend, we are going to strip back and we are going to peel back those lies and say, no, mm -mm. 
this is what may, I may feel or believe, but this is what my Father says. This is what my Heavenly Father, who flung stars off of his fingertips, who has scars on his hands, says about me. So I want you to pour through it. I don't want you to just get on the surface. But below the surface, the things that you have believed about yourself that you haven't even told another person. We're not going to walk out of here this weekend with those things lingering around. So will you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your grace is sufficient. We thank you that we have a loving, perfect Father in heaven. Perfect. Who doesn't say the wrong thing at the wrong time. Who is slow to anger and abounding in love who is gracious, who is kind, who is merciful. A perfect, 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 loving Father who despite our rebellion is waiting and looking and waiting to rejoice when we come home to Him. So Father, may you establish in our hearts a fresh in a good perspective of who you are. Because God, if we see you for who you really are, then we will believe what you say about us. Not what the enemy says, but what our loving Father in heaven who made us, who knows us, who knows the number of hairs upon our heads says about us. That we are wonderfully and fearfully made. So God, may that be written on our minds and our hearts this weekend. God, you would expose the lies of the enemy. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And it's in the mighty and powerful name of Jesus we pray. And everybody said, amen. Once you stand to your feet, we're going to continue to worship. about what you're going to write on that paper and just surrender it. Start start acting now. So we're going to sing. I welcome you guys to worship with us. Staying 
desperate for you, God. And send me humbled at your feet. I lift these hands and pray.
join the song of our redemption. We raise a banner for the King. Our golden crown, we lay them down for Thee. So we shout from the depths of our redeemed love for the blood that you shed as our ransom. Hear the sound, heaven shake, be exalted, King of glory.
say that they love if it costs them nothing, but God, you pay a price for us who rejected you. Let our hearts be filled with joy tonight, God, because we are yours. We belong to you, Jesus. We belong to you. That's who you are. That's your character, Lord. You're that good, loving Father. 
thank you, Lord, that that is your word, and your word is truth, the truth on which we can stand. So I pray, Lord, tonight, and what you're speaking in anyone's heart, God, there are some in here, maybe they don't think they're worthy. Father, there are some in here who, maybe there's that thing that happened to them, or there's that thing that they've done that they have just refused to tell anybody about. Maybe tonight's the night that they let that go. Lord, whatever it is tonight, I, you're a chain-breaking God. We declare that, Lord. We believe that. <laughs> We've seen that. So would you just break chains and speak your love? So, Father, as we prepare to go, just continue to work in our hearts, Lord. Remind us who we worship. Remind us who we are before right now. And keep us in that reverence in you.